is. So we left off on the warfare of the Old Testament, looking at the hostile waters, and um, how that's, that, that's the primary way that ancient Near Eastern people thought about threatening forces, deconstruction, decreational forces, forces of chaos. It's sometimes called in ancient Near Eastern literature the chaos conf motif. Uh, it's a conflict with chaos. And uh, you find it all over the place in the Mesopotamian world, ancient Near Eastern world, and it finds, shows itself in the Bible this way. So just as you read the Bible, whenever you come across water, be suspicious, because it may be talking about natural water, but it's more likely at least also talking about cosmic water, and sometimes it, it means both. But it has to do with forces of chaos. Then, uh, a second way that we find uh, the forces of evil uh, portrayed in the Old Testament, um, and this also parallels what you find in other ancient Eastern literature, is uh, talking about cosmic beasts. These were water dragons. Uh, ancient Eastern people saw the waters surrounding the earth as being hostile, always threatening, had to be held at bay. And the waters themselves are often personified as beasts, but sometimes the forces of evil are portrayed as the beasts in the water. And so you read about Leviathan and Rahab and Behemoth. And these are rather typical ancient Near Eastern creatures. We can draw parallels with a lot of other Canaanite, Ugaritic, uh, Mesopotamian um, uh, creatures that we find in their literature. Um, but we read things like this, Psalm 74. You, Yahweh, divided the sea by your might. And the word sea there is yom. Some scholars argue that it's an actual personal reference to a Canaanite deity whose name was Yom. So we're not sure whether to translate it Yom or translate it Sea. Either way, it refers to this hostile sea. Uh, you divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the dragons in the waters. And given Hebraic parallelism, those statements aren't saying different things. There are different ways of saying the same thing. You defeated the waters. You defeated the dragons of the waters. Same thing. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. And once in a while, you'll hear some folks, usually young earth creationists, trying to argue that Leviathan and Rahab and Behemoth were natural creatures. Some even would say dinosaurs, if you think that dinosaurs coexisted with uh, human beings. But I don't know anybody who has ever argued that any dinosaur had multiple heads. These are mythological creatures, and, and we only have to read the parallel literature in the surrounding cultures to see that. Um, it's the way that they thought about powers of chaos. You gave them as food for the creatures of the wilderness. Just a way of sort of expressing Yahweh's supremacy over Leviathan. One way to, if you ask the question, are these mythic creatures, the answer is yes. But if you ask the question, are they real creatures, the answer is yes. And those are not antithetical things. It'd be no different than if I were to say to you, draw me a picture of Satan. Guaranteed majority of people would draw a picture of the god, Greek god, Pan. Because most of our pictures of, of uh, Satan are derived from Greek mythology, particularly the Greek god Pan, with the, the hoofs and the horns and the spiked uh, tail and holding a pitchfork. Um, and, and that would be mythic. That's a mythic expression of reality. And so it's not antithetical to say, yes, it's mythic, and yes, it's real. This is just how, when ancient Near Eastern people thought about Satan, this is the way they thought about it. And they were borrowing from their neighbors because everything is contextualized. And as was said earlier today, God meets us where we're at. So he'll use whatever there is in the culture as his material to communicate truth through it. Uh, Behemoth is the first of the great acts of God. Only its maker can approach it with a, a sword. And the connotation there of the Hebrew uh, is, I'm told, uh, Gibson argues this in his commentary, that he's saying only its maker can approach it, and even he carries a sword. So it's, a, it's just a, an ancient way of saying this is a ferocious, ferocious beast. And we'll, I'll say more about those chaotic monsters when I talk about Job a little bit later on. And then there are in the Old Testament the gods. There are rebel gods. Um, many today define monotheism as the belief in only one god. And that is not quite accurate from a biblical perspective, um, as though there could not be any other gods that exist. In a biblical perspective, there's only one creator god, that's true. But it presupposes that there are multiple gods all the time. Yahweh is greater than all the gods. You find that statement dozens and dozens of times, which presupposes that there are other gods. It would not be a compliment to say that Yahweh is greater than these non-existent things. No, they believe that there are other gods. We today call them angels. I like the, God, the word gods a little better, though. 
because we've been too culturized by angels, and we tend to see them as little cherubims sitting on clouds, playing harps, wearing diapers. Uh, the, the, the biblical concept of gods is much more robust than that. And some gods are part of Yahweh's host, his heavenly council, his heavenly army. Uh, but there are other gods that are rebel gods, and Yahweh battles them. And then there are some where it's not quite clear what to do with them. And this is just a good reminder that um, we, we, we can't think that our theological systems have, have got everything nice and tidied up the way we might like them. Uh, so we, we, Western folks tend to think, that we assume, that uh, unlike people, um, all the angels or all the gods are either unequivocally good or unequivocally bad. But there are a few indications in Scripture that maybe that's not entirely the case. Psalms 82 is, is uh, the best case in point, where here the author says that, that God stands in the council of the gods, the mighty ones, sometimes called, the Ben Elohim. And um, uh, he passes judgment, and he says to them, how long are you going to be on the side of the, the rich and the oppressors? I've called you to be on the side of the poor and the oppressed, uh, on the side of those who are weak. Uh, who don't know what's going on. He says, I, I, I've called you gods because that's what you are, but you will die like mere mortals unless you uh, carry out my assignments. So here they're, they're in the council of God, so they're not unequivocally evil, and yet God is reaming them out, so they're not unequivocally good. And maybe it's the case that um, I suspect that human beings are all in, 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 in one of uh, a couple of positions, uh, most have not yet resolved themselves one way or another for or against God, but some are now re resolved to be on Yahweh's side, and their character is formed to the point where God at least knows, even if they don't, that they are permanent. They're, they've now solidified their character in this direction. They're no longer just people who choose to side with Yahweh. Uh, they are people whose very nature is on Yahweh's side. They've grown in that direction. And there, there are, then there are undoubtedly some who have solidified themselves in the other direction, who through persistent resistance to God's will have made themselves incapable of ever responding positively to God's will. These are perhaps the folks that are referred to as those who have committed the unforgivable sin or the sin that is unto death. Because any sin that you can confess would be a sin that God would forgive. Uh, and so these are folks who are too far gone to ever ask for forgiveness. So there are some who are resolved on the one side and some who are resolved on, on, on the other. And then the, the, there are the uh, others in, among humans who are in between. They haven't yet resolved themselves one way or another. Maybe they've chosen, but their character isn't yet fully there. And so it may be that among angelic beings, perhaps they've had a lot longer to be at it, so maybe many more are resolved on one side or the other. But there are perhaps some that are still in between. I'm just throwing this out as a sort of hypothesis. Uh, however you do it, you have to account for passages like this, and it's always good to be reminded of passages that don't fit into your theological system, if only to keep us humble and not to get arrogant with our theological systems. All right. So then there's um, a Daniel 10, another example of, it was brought up a little bit earlier, of, of a God who uh, is working at cross purposes with God. Yahweh uh, Daniel prays, and he's in fasting, and Yahweh uh, responds by sending this angel, and then the angel gets detained by the prince of Persia for 21 days, and, Michael, and God has to call over Michael the archangel to free up this angel to deliver this message to Daniel, and then the, the angel says to Daniel, hey, I'd love to stay in chat, but I gotta go because the prince of Gr Greece is joining in the bruja. And so it turns out there's this kind of battle going on in the spiritual realm that interferes with God's answer to prayer a variable that is important to remember that we'll talk about uh, in the next session. Um, but uh, he, he, this is clearly a God, a God who apparently has some jurisdiction over Persia, but a God who is now working at cross purposes uh, with God. Just like with us, God gives us say-so. We all have an influence on in what comes to pass. And we can use that say-so in accordance with God or against God. We have our own little kingdom, if you will, our domain of influence. And in God's purpose, we're to bring our kingdom in alignment with his kingdom so that now his kingdom is expanded through us. But we can, if we choose, create our own kingdom as an alternative to his, in competition with his. And now we're working at cross purposes with his kingdom. And now we'll be to, to the degree that we have say so, we can thwart some of what God wants to do through us and even what God wants to do with others as this angelic being did with God's purposes in delivering this message to Daniel. But the gods are then another one of the foes that Yahweh must, uh, must confront in the Old Testament. And the final being that God has to confront in the Old Testament 
The one we hear much more about in the New Testament is uh, Hasatan, the adversary. And we don't read much about him in the Old Testament, so we don't need to spend much time on this. Uh, in in uh, two of the references, he's just referred to as a, a noun, the Satan, which means the adversary. And then in uh, Chronicles and Zephaniah, he acquires the proper name, Satan. Uh, but he, he is not yet at this stage the full, he is a malicious being. I, I, I don't think, I mean, there's some scholars who argue he was just, he was sort of the inspector, the quality control inspector of God's heavenly court uh, at this early stage of Revelation. And I think that's mistaken. Uh, but he isn't yet the full-orbed uh, evil being that we find him to be in the New Testament. But he does oppose God. He does oppose God. And so we read about him in uh, Job 1 and 2. We read about him in, in 1 Chronicles 21. He's the one who incites David to sin. Uh, we read about him in uh, Zechariah chapter 3 where he accuses Joshua. And then there's other uh, passages where he's not mentioned. But in traditional Christian exegesis, these passages were assumed to be about him. So those... Those are just the indications, the waters, the, the cosmic monsters, the rebel gods, and then most of all, Satan. Um, and those are the forces that God contends with in the Old Testament. So despite the fact that we have in the Old Testament a strong emphasis on uh, monotheism, on the one creator God, uh, because God needs to give the foundation before he nuances it with the warfare, nonetheless, we still have a very robust warfare worldview going on in the Old Testament. It's nothing like what we find in the New Testament, however. Beginning around 200 B.C., um, it appears that some Jews began to, well, the standard interpretation was the reason why we're not a sovereign nation, the reason why, reason why we suffer the way we do at the hands of the Gentiles is because we haven't been faithful. That's how the covenantal promises would have led you to expect uh, that, that um, uh, all, all punishment is the result of covenantal unfaithfulness uh, to Yahweh. Around the 2nd century B.C., that explanation seems to have begun to have grown thin on, on, on the minds of some Jews. Uh, yes, Yahweh can be angry with us, but this is, we're going on eight centuries now where we have not been a sovereign nation. <laughs> um, something else is going on here. And um, when the punishment motif no longer worked as an explanation for the evil that the Jews were suffering they began to look for a different explanation, and the explanation they found was about spiritual warfare. And so uh, around the second century B.C., we see an explosion of literature. It's called apocalyptic literature. And what characterizes this apocalyptic literature is that there's a, a much more uh, power ascribed to the gods, uh, the rebel gods, and to fallen angels than we find in previous literature. Um, we, we have a, a, a much more of a robust warfare worldview. The earth is seized by these powers, and there's battles going on, and a lot of the evil that is found in the world is the result, not, not of us being unfaithful, not of God punishing anybody, it's just because there are malevolent beings that encompass this earth and engulf this earth. That's the apocalyptic worldview, and the New Testament is birthed right smack dab in the middle of that apocalyptic era. And so it's important to read the New Testament against the backdrop of apocalyptic literature, of the apocalyptic time. But what's interesting is the New Testament takes that apocalyptic warfare worldview and intensifies it even further. What we have in the New Testament is the most intense version of uh, apocalyptic warfare uh, that we find in anything in the contemporary literature. It's really quite astounding. So, for example, we read about the scope of Satan's domain. And in the surrounding apocalyptic literature, uh, Satan isn't identified as the, the head of this rebel army. In fact, in the apocalyptic literature, there's not really a clear understanding that it is one unified army. There's just sort of a society of beings that are rebels. Only in the New Testament do we get a clear idea that this, this kingdom, this counter kingdom, is, is one army under one leader, and that leader's name is the, the Hasatan, the adversary. Now we see Satan in his true colors. Um, and the scope of his domain is, is, is astounding. So three times in the book of John, John 12, 14, and 16, Jesus calls Satan the archon of this age. The word archon was a political term. It was used for the highest ruling authority in any region. If you went into a region and you want to know who's boss, who's in charge, you, you say, who's the archon? And so Jesus three times here calls Satan the archon of this world. The archon of this world, the CEO. It doesn't mean that he's the CEO everywhere, but it means in this domain, he's the boss. 
He's the primary influencer calling the shots uh, in this world. Uh, in Luke 4, we have this fascinating thing where Satan offers Jesus, as one of the three temptations, offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, all the, their power and authority and their glory. And he says, I, I will give these to you because all, these all have been given to me, and I can give them to whoever I want. And if you'll just bow down, I will give them to you. It doesn't mean that Jesus would have to actually worship Satan. Uh, the word is proskune. It, it, it does mean that he would have to come under him, do it his style, a power over style. He'd have to rule the way Satan rules. On the other hand, having all the authority of the governments of this world, he could have the best justice system possible. He could have all the right laws. He could have all the right people in place. Think of all the good he could have accomplished overnight. Immediately, the Jews would have been liberated from the Roman oppressors. Yeah, it would have been a top-down power over regime. That's how you have to run this world. You've got to be practical. You can't run the world turning the other cheek for crying out loud. If a nation does that, you're going to be sacked overnight. Uh, you know, you've got to use the sword, but, but you can use it in a just way. And so overnight, you could have had here the best justice system imaginable. What's amazing is that Jesus doesn't dispute that Satan has that power. Scholars debate whether it was humans who gave Satan that power or whether God gave Satan that power before he rebelled. Could be either one. But either way, the power, the authority of all these governments has been given to Satan. And now he says, I can give them to whoever I will. And Jesus doesn't say, oh, you're exaggerating. Get out of here. You can't do that. No, and in fact, throughout the temptation narratives, the irony is that there are temptations precisely because what Satan says is true. It's all true. He quotes the scripture true. He just applies it in the wrong way. And so the pattern should lead us to believe that that's what's going on here. What he's saying is true. And in fact, Jesus had come for all the kingdoms of this world. He got even that right. The one thing he got wrong was how Jesus is going to get them back. Instead of doing it in a power over Caesar kind of way that would have conformed to Satan's modus operandi, Jesus is going to get all the authority of the kingdoms of this world back, but he's going to do it by the power of the Lamb by the power of self-sacrificial love, offering himself up on the cross. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. The lamb waging war the way the lamb does. And he does it with speaking, by speaking the truth and laying down his life. That's what his followers do too. The, they follow the lamb wherever he goes. And they uh, love not Lord their life, even unto death. Uh, but they, uh, they, they, they die by the blood of the lamb, meaning they die the way the lamb died. Uh, so he's going to get the kingdoms back. But instead of doing it the quick way, the practical way, the expedient way, which is always to us the most wise way, because let's be reasonable here, let's be practical here. The sword, yeah, it's not pleasant, but it does get the job done. Um, and Jesus says, you know what, I'll, I'll get it, but it's going to be a slow, arduous, painful way. And it's by laying down my life for my enemies. And then he turns to us and he says, do the same. So we're to be taking it all back, absolutely. But the all-important question is how? And the trick of the enemy for the, towards the church from the 5th century on has been to have us regard practical considerations to trump faithful considerations. So it's here Satan is offering Jesus all the power of the sword, of the law, all of that. It's all yours. You can run it as just as you want. Man, feed the hungry, uh, house the poor, take care of all your Jewish loved ones. They don't have to suffer anymore. No more Roman oppression. Those nasty Romans round up people, sacrifice 7,000 at one time just to make a point. That's what they do. They're the terrorists who have won. We can get rid of them. Say the word. Get rid of them. And Jesus says, get the behind me. You know, you're, this is Satan. This is a temptation of Satan. So 400 years later, Satan comes around and offers the same deal to the church. I give you the power of the sword. Not the whole world like before, but at least the whole Roman Empire. Uh, and you just got to do it my way, okay? Just proscune. Uh, and, and, uh, but, you know, listen, you guys are the righteous ones. You know God, right? And who better to run the world than you guys? I don't have to have pagans running this thing, being, being, being persecuted by the pagans. No, no, no. You can rule. And God wants you to rule. Why wouldn't he want you to rule? You're the smart ones, the righteous ones, the superior ones. You're not like those sinners out there. And so with Constantine, he has this alleged vision to go into battle under the banner of Christ, and he ends up winning. And then the church says, oh, look, at God gave him the victory. First time Jesus is associated with warfare. Now Jesus becomes just like your typical pagan gods. That's what the pagan gods do. They give you victory in battle. That's their job, right? And you know whose God is bigger by who wins. 
So Jesus now is reduced to one more warrior pagan god. Constantine allegedly believes in him, even though he keeps on acting the way he did before he was converted, has any, any threats assassinated, including his brother. Um, but he offers this to the church and then begins to throw money at the church and begins to throw power at the church because he believes that uh, the Christian's God is the right God. And um, now, the, instead of seeing this as a temptation of Satan, which is, I would argue it was, this vision that Constantine allegedly had, instead of seeing that as a satanic temptation, the church says, ah, blessed, now we don't have to be persecuted anymore. We thought we'd have to do the Jesus cross-carrying thing all the while, but it turns out that was just a provisional thing to get this thing off the ground. Now he's given us the power of the sword. And so now we shall rule in righteousness and peace for the glory of God. And the result of that is the religion of Christendom. And the history of the church is the history of that religion. And God uses everything, so some good came out of it. Absolutely, I'm not going to say it's all demonic. But it also is the church that persecuted whoever uh, disagreed with it. Uh, it's the church of the Inquisition, the church of the Crusades, the church of the witch hunts, and so on and so on and so on. You, when you put down, when you pick up the cross, you put down the sword. You can't carry the two. Um, the, way, the way the church of, 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 of uh, Christendom tried to do it, the, the Constantinian church, is, uh, there are some special people who are called to carry the cross. They went to the monasteries. The rest of us are just average folks, and so we, we have to be saved by grace and we'll carry the sword. Uh, it doesn't work. But uh, we need to see here that there's no indication that this is no longer true. And just enter into the possibility that this statement is true. The possibility of it. Because after all, most of us here would say that Scripture is inspired, so it's got to be true. And if we believe this was at all true, well, just think through the ramifications of that. Would anyone be shocked any longer that our politicians do evil once in a while? Can you imagine Jesus being shocked at anything Caesar or Nero did? I mean, we get shocked at some of what our politicians do, but man, what our politicians do is Disney World compared to what those politicians did, man. Read about Nero. <laughs> Ooh, it is. Uh, and yet you don't read a word about it in the New Testament. They did not care. Of course, that's what Caesars and the world's governments are going to do. But that's why we're to offer an alternative kingdom. Uh, if we really believe this, see, most want to believe this is true for every other nation but our own. Ours is the exception. We're the one, we're the, we're the one nation under God. All the other ones are under the devil. We're under God. Uh, good luck making that exegetical case. Uh, you're going to have a hard time with it. I, I, I just, I, I think that if, if, if a fraction of American Christians really even half believe this statement, they'd be, spend less time arguing over the politics of the world and a little more time doing the, advancing the kingdom of God, the alternative to all the politics of the world. Um, and and that, that's our, our main job. Then we've, got, then we've got this incredible statement in 1 John 5, 19, where Satan has control of the entire world, has power over the entire world. And I, However you work out, maybe there's a little hyperbole going on there, I don't know, but it, it, it certainly denotes what Luke 4 implies, and that is a strong, 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 oppressive power. If we believe this even a little bit, I, it would never occur to us to ask, why do good things happen to bad people? That is a vacation question. It's not a warfare question. That's a vacation you ask when you're surprised by evil happening, like when you're on vacation, because when you're on vacation, you're supposed to be comfortable. But if you're in the middle of a war, you'd never ask that question. You'd rather say, thank God that a little bit of good happened to some good people. Uh, that's, that should be the surprise. It totally reframes our whole idea of blessing and, and cursing. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, uh, Paul says that this is the God of this age. He uses that term God towards Satan. He's the God of this world, the God of this age. And note that he says this after the resurrection. So there's a sense in which Satan is, is uh, slain on the cross. Colossians 2, 14 and 15 talk about that. But there's also a very real sense in which he still is the God of this age. He still is the archon of this, this world. He still is controlling the entire world. And we live in that environment. In Ephesians 2, 2, Paul says that Satan is the principality and power of the air, or a better translation, is, he really says Satan is the archon, there's that word again, archon, the ruler of the exousia, the authority of the air. He's the ruler of the authority of the air. 
And to understand the full import of that, you need to understand a little bit about first century cosmology where their understanding was that the air represented the, the, the domain of authority, not of the whole cosmos, but over this, this parcel of the land, the earth, the environment. And so the CEO of this jurisdiction is the god of this age, uh, Satan. The, it's another way of saying that this earth and the environment of the earth and everything about this earth is polluted with a destructive evil influence. It's a destructive evil influence of Satan. And this is so not what we want to hear. Now, in other cultures, they hear this, and it's not even very interesting. It's like, duh, third world countries, they don't need proof of this. This isn't surprising. They deal with corrupt governments all the time. Satan rules the government. <laughs> Newsflash. Uh, you know, poverty, disease, rampant. But we have, in the Western culture, been able to create this illusion of, a, of an oasis, uh, which makes us just inclined to want to believe that we're more in a vacation sort of uh, mindset, vacation world. And I, I find, as I've taught this, students sometimes resist this so strongly. But what about the glory of God in the heavens? What about, you know, Louis Armstrong? I say to myself, it's a wonderful world. You know, um, yeah, you can still see the glory of God all around. That's true. But it also is the case that you see a world that is ravaged by war if you'll get your head out of the sand and look around. And uh, in fact, the way the world looks is, is, I think, maybe not quite as bad as you'd expect given what the New Testament says about it, but it basically reflects. You see, beauty that, that testifies to a beautiful creator, a design that testifies to a great designer, but you also find nightmarish, nightmarish evil that testifies to an anti-creator, an anti-creational, destructive thief who comes to do nothing but kill, steal, and destroy. And the New Testament's word is that that influence is the stronger influence right here and right now. That's the apocalyptic worldview of the New Testament. So this is the context in which we find ourselves. Revelation 13, Satan is the one who deceives the inhabitants of the earth. Re Revelation 20, he deceives all the nations. And as I read the book of Revelation, it's not about the last seven years of world history. It's, it's about events that happened in the first century that establish patterns that go on throughout all of history. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's denoting present uh, realities with a finality at the end. Uh, but... Um, this is expressing a truth here and now. That right now there is one who deceives the inhabitants of the earth. One who deceives all the nations. And so we just need to be aware that we are up against a strong deceiving force. Uh, and he's at work 24-7. He never tires. Hebrews 2.14 says he's the Lord of death. Satan has the keys of death. Jesus appeared to destroy the one who has the keys of death. That those who all their lives have been afraid of death would fear no longer. He has the keys of death. Jesus says in John 8 that he's, he's a murderer from the beginning. And I, I think that the majority of scholars agree that, that he's referring to, the idea behind this is that all death is a form of murder. All death is unnatural. It wasn't meant to be. Uh, and the one who's ultimately behind it is Satan, who holds the keys of death. That will have important ramifications here in a little bit because death, as we, as we experience it now, is the most natural thing in the world. It's part of the physical laws. It's, we can't imagine a, a cosmos without death. Uh, you know, in one generation, the earth would be too populated if we didn't have death. It, it's, it's normal. Um, and yet, here we're told in the New Testament that it's not normal. It's abnormal. And if, the, the, if death is abnormal and death is simply the application of the second law of thermodynamics and other physical laws as we know them, then that tells us that the laws as they now are are not the laws that are exactly as God created them to be. Everything has been corrupted. Say more about that in, in a moment. So that was the scope of, of, uh, of um, uh, Satan's domain. Uh, you see this reflected in the fact that throughout the, the New Testament, all healing is freeing people from Satan, Satan's oppression. There's the influence of, of this evil, sinister, anti-God being and his minions is seen in the fact that they, the New Testament ascribes all afflictions directly or indirectly to their presence. And so in Acts 10, verse 38, Peter is summing up the ministry of Jesus. And he says that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. 
healing all who are under the power of the devil. That suggests that everybody who was sick and infirmed was to some degree under the power of the devil. Why? Because that's not the work of Abba Father. Uh, that's the work, maybe it's of natural laws as we understand them now, but the laws as we understand them now are themselves, to some degree at least, tainted by the work of the thief who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. This one I got from James Kalis a uh, number of years ago when uh, I learned that the, the word for healing in the New Testament uh, at least at times, is not the normal word for healing. Or the word for affliction, I mean, is not the normal word for affliction. It's the word mystix, which literally means flogging or scourging. And so in some of the cases where Jesus says, go, you are set free from your infirmity, a more literal translation would be, go, you're set free from your flogging, from your, uh, from, from your scourging. And then the Gospels make it very clear who is doing the scourging? It's not God the Father. Uh, if that was the case, you'd have the Father working against the Son, because this is the stuff that the Son battles. Rather, the scourging is done by the one who has the power over all this, and that is Satan. So the New Testament portrays illnesses, diseases, infirmities as scourgings of the devil. And, and, it's, and this is why you have a, a, a real fluidity in the New Testament between healing and demonization. Sometimes Jesus... It says a person is demonized, demonizomai, and Jesus heals them. A lot of times it says a person is afflicted with an infirmity, and yet Jesus delivers them. Sometimes Jesus treats illnesses as though they were a demon. He rebukes uh, a, a fever. Uh, there's an overlap here. And it, we can't have any formulas about this, I don't think. I don't think we need to infer that every sickness has a demon behind it, um, or that, that every demonized person is going to be sick. But there is an overlap there. The most fundamental point for us to get is that all that does not reflect the loving character of Abba Father in our existence is directly or indirectly the result of the, the, the dome, the domain of God's archenemy, Satan. The thief who comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. Oh, that's weird. What I'm seeing on my screen is totally different. Well, glory. So Jesus' warfare program, I don't know, there's a, there's a white thing on, on it is, I, here, I bet, I bet if you just click this right here, you could, should I try it? I'm going to do it. We're going to, I did it! <laughs> Be loosed! That, that's my way of, of dealing with technology. Just cast demons out of it. There are demons of technology, I'm telling you. If there are demons of mutinous and deafness, there's demons of technology. That's right. Um, Jesus' warfare program is, and I, I like the, the image that was uh, drawn here earlier, where we, we tend to think of it as a horizontal you know, push back like this. It's more effective to think of it in concentric circles. So think about this. Uh, a kingdom is any domain over which one is king. A king's domain, a king's dome. A dome over which one reigns is his king's dome. So the kingdom of Satan is the dome over which Satan reigns. So you picture this building. If this was the dome of Satan, this is all the creation here, okay? This is the dome of Satan. He reigns over this dome. He's the main CEO. God's working for sure. He hasn't given up on the creation, but, but he's got to work against the, the forces of, uh, of evil. And, and the, the, the owner of this domain, the God of this age, the archon of this world is, is Satan. The kingdom, I, I, I sometimes use as an analogy of this. This is, the, this is where, king, where God is. This is God's dome, God's domain, where God reigns. All right? And, and so picture it as though it was a balloon here. If I had a balloon and I started blowing up that balloon... And this, the balloon represents the, the, the kingdom of God. All lives who are surrendered to him are now part of his kingdom, by definition. They become part of the dome over which God is king. And it starts as a little mustard seed with the death and resurrection of Jesus, right? It's a little tiny thing. Here's this big domain of Satan, but here's this tiny little balloon. But the promise is that uh, as, we, as, as, as we yield and as we advance the gospel, this balloon's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And notice, every square inch that the balloon expands is pushing back the domain in which Satan is king. By definition, you can't advance the one without pushing back the other. And so here we're stationed behind enemy, uh, uh, we're in, uh, we're, we're behind enemy lines, enemy-occupied territory. God wants to take it all back. And he's going to use his body to do it, the body of all who are surrendered over to him. And, and so the mustard seed is planted in us. And then we yield to it, and it's supposed to take over our mind and take over our attitude, take over our thoughts, take over our actions. And the more it takes over our actions, the more we become conduits to influence our environment 
by how we treat people, how we speak, how we pray, and so on. And, and that invites others in on this, this alternative kingdom. So then they begin to get the mustard seed planted in them, and it takes over their minds and their speech and their attitudes and whatever. And now the, the, the balloon is growing. The dome, God's domain, is growing. And it's pushing back at every step the kingdom of darkness. That is, I think, a good way of thinking about what's going on here. Um, and so Jesus' program is simply to preach and demonstrate the kingdom. This is what he's always telling people to do. You announce the kingdom is here, and then you demonstrate it. You demonstrate it, and then you announce it. Put on display signs that the kingdom is here. Set people free. Set them free from demons. Uh, heal their diseases. And then announce the kingdom of God is, is, is here. Over and over again, that's what we read uh, that, that Jesus is all about. It's a very simple program. Uh, you see this in the summary statements about Jesus' ministry. In the ancient world, they had to write on parchment, and so summary statements become, they had to leave out a lot of details. They had to be editors, and so summary statements become very important when you're reading ancient literature. Look for the, the punchlines, the summary statements. We've got numerous examples of this in the Gospels, and they all say the same thing. Things like, he preached uh, the good news, he cured every disease and every sickness, they brought all the sick and afflicted and demoniacs, and he cured them all. all the t that's what you read. That's what Jesus did. He taught, but he healed, he delivered, and um, he announced the kingdom, and then he demonstrated the kingdom. So again, Peter summarized it very well in Acts 10.38 when he said uh, he went about doing good and healing all who were under the, the, the devil's uh, affliction. You see, something about the centrality of warfare in the New Testament, going beyond now the Gospels, when you, when you turn uh, to uh, the Jesus' teaching on the church, um, he talks about the kingdom much more than he talks about the church. Only mentions the church a couple of times. But it's clear in the epistles that the church is to be the conduit of the kingdom, the reign of God. And just note how the first time he mentions the church, how it's, and he gives its marching orders, our Magna Carta. It's all about spiritual warfare. It is fantastic, amazing, that the church has so thoroughly missed this throughout much of its history when it's so blatant here in the New Testament. So you know the story where Jesus says, what do people say about me? And they say, well, some say you're Simon, or some say you're, you're Elijah, or John the Baptist, you know, one of the prophets. And then he goes, well, who do you say that I am? Let's make it personal. And then Peter says, you are, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood didn't reveal to you but my Father who is in heaven. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Okay. So here's the thing. Note that the rock is, I would argue, is Peter's confession of faith. I know there's a long tradition that says that the rock was Peter himself. Um, I would argue that the, exact op the point of the passage is the exact opposite of that. Uh, Jesus says, you are Petros. And the word Petros means little rock or pebble-like or rock-like. You're a little rock. You're a Petros. But on this Petra... Referring to this confession, I will build my church. What just came out of you was way bigger than you, Peter. I would never think of building my church on you. Well, you're going to deny me here before too long. Uh, no, but on what you just said, that came from my Father in heaven. And that's the rock. The rock is the confession of Jesus' divinity. The divinity of, uh, and the lordship of, of Jesus Christ. On that rock, I'm going to build my church. Know that Jesus is the one who builds the church. If you're going to be a church planner or missionary... Please do the kingdom a favor and never think for a second that it's your church. Uh, you're not, you don't build a church. He'll use you to build a church, but he's the one who builds the church. Uh, one of the most freeing things that I ever got in, in ministry was when uh, the Lord showed me, 1 Corinthians 3, that Paul plants and Apollos waters, but God gives the increase. And it just set me free from having to worry about how many people show up or what the offering is or how am I doing compared to so-and-so. I'm to plant, I'm to water, and then leave it. God will give the increase. And what God really showed me is I'm to be as delighted if I have three to preach to as if I have three million, and it should make no difference because that's about God. Uh, my job is to preach what I'm told to preach, to water how I'm told to water, and to plant how I'm told to plant. God will build the church. Never assume. The minute we think it's our church, we get egotistical and weird and jealous, and, oh, the carnality that is in the ministry is just putrid. The gates of Hades. This is interesting. The gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. First thing he says, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to do it, not you. And it's going to be the rock of your confession, not you. But the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. 
The Hades is, of course, the realm of death. And Gates, I, I want us to note this. I, I, I heard in my early years as a Christian over and over again this kind of thing about how you know, the promise of Jesus in this passage is, is so reassuring. It gives us such comfort because we can know that if, as long as we stay in the church, the big bad devil can't get us. We are secure in the church. The devil can't get into the church. No way. We are secure. Uh, nothing devil God does can get to us. We are safe and secure. Lies is right. Because you've got to ask, what the hell? Say, yes, the enemy doesn't like me doing this lecture, I'm telling you. He just does not like it at all. Um, you've got to ask yourself, when was the last time you ever heard uh, of gates being used as offensive weapons? And maybe in a Monty Python movie, that's about it. <laughs> you don't attack another army with your gates. Let's go get them with our gates. You know, pull up the gates, we'll, go, we'll beat you with our gates. Gates are defensive structures that are meant to keep enemies out. And so when Jesus says the gates of Hades can't prevail against you, the word prevail here is, is, is catastuo, and it's, it's better translated withstand you, precisely because the whole imagery presupposes not that Satan is attacking us and we're secure behind the gates, but rather that we are attacking Satan and his gates aren't secure against us. He's not the one on the offense against us. We are on the offense against him. All right, so it presupposes... As in the vacation world, you don't go looking for trouble. In the vacation world, you try to keep his life as convenient as possible. But when you're at war, you're going to be looking for hell. We're going to be hell raisers, folks. We're, give me some hell. I, 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 we're going to be looking for hell. And when we find the hell, we're going to storm it and, and uh, know that the gates can't withstand us. Why? Because we're, 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 uh, we're walking in the name of Jesus. So we're, we're the aggressors on this thing. That's the Magna Carta of the church. I'm going to build a church, and guess what? It's going to be invading hell. The church is to be hell raisers, hell invaders. Um, that, that, that's our main job description. And so wherever we find hell, in our own life, in our families, in our neighborhoods, wherever, we're to be uh, going at it um, all the way that Jesus did, not cocky, not arrogant, not full of testosterone, not like we're going to take, oh, quick, but we don't know. We do it in a Calvary kind of way, but we do it. We do it aggressively, uh, tearing down the, the gates of, of hell, bringing truth where there's, there's lies and hope where there's despair and, um, and manifesting the kingdom in every way, shape, and form, and then announcing, oh, by the way, in case you're wondering, this is brought to you by the kingdom. Uh, you can join us. Uh, that's what it is. You just... Do it, and then, then explain it. Then I'll, I'll just say a word about this, because I think it's, it's uh, very much neglected, and it's at the center of the Roberta uh, Winter Institute. Roberta Winter Institute. It has to do with Jesus and natural evil. Um, there's a, a common assumption in philosophical circles that there's two kinds of evil that need to be explained. There's moral evil and natural evil. Moral evil is evil caused by human beings. Natural evil is evil that human beings don't, have, don't, don't appear to have anything to do with. Uh, the diseases, the parasites, viruses, bacteria, mudslides, earthquakes, and so on and so on. Um, I'd like to suggest to you that, there's, that ultimately all evil is moral evil and there, that there is no such thing as natural evil. Uh, here's my case. Um, note that the sickness and the disease, the disabilities and deaths that Jesus healed and or exercised were all, natural, uh, were all a natural part of nature. In other words, you could explain all the things that Jesus confronted as being just the ways that the, uh, nature operates. You have natural mutations, you have natural... Uh, it's all part of the natural world. And yet, the Gospels uniformly diagnose them as being directly or indirectly the result of uh, demonic influence. That tells me that nature as it now is, is not natural. There's nothing natural about disease and sickness. Uh, Satan displays a power over nature in Job 1 and 2. He's the one who caused the lightning to fall and, and the wind, a gust of wind or whatever. He has some kind of power over nature there. Uh, he, he has that same kind of power we read about in the book of Revelation. And Hebrews 2 tells us that Satan holds the keys of death. All of that is to say that there's biblical precedent for seeing nature as we see it now and as we experience it now as to be in an unnatural state. It's been corrupted. The common Western view is to think that the fall was all about human beings and that's it. Human beings fell, uh, but nature is pretty much the normal thing. Uh, and I'm, I'm submitting to you that, no, that the, the nature is, right now, everything's been tainted by the fall. 
In fact, I think there was a fall before our fall, which already tainted everything. Um, nature itself has been corrupted. The entire creation has been subjected to futility, Paul says in Romans 8. Um, we read in, in Mark 9 that Jesus rebukes a storm, a raging sea. He treats this storm as it was a demon. There's another thing that uh, J- James Kalis was really good at um, getting at. That, that Jesus here, the literal Greek says he, he, he chokes it. He silences it, muzzles it. Um, and it, 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 it seems there that there, he's assuming that there's something demonic in this storm. Now, it doesn't mean, and we shouldn't infer, that therefore there's a demon behind every tornado, behind every threatening storm, or, or anything like that. But I think, it, I think it does warrant the conclusion that were the world not fallen and under Satan's oppression, you wouldn't, humans would never be threatened by nature. We wouldn't have life-threatening storms. Maybe there'd still be storms that we would have an authority over them. Maybe like what Jesus manifested. Uh, in fact, I, I would argue that what Je- everything Jesus did, he did out of his, uh, what it looks like to be a perfect human being, uh, manifesting the Imago Dei. We'd have authority over that stuff. That's part of what we surrendered uh, with the rebellion. Um, but it, it shows that, that nature as it now is, is not the way it was designed to be. Um, and a lot of scholars argue that Jesus' rebuking of the sea in Mark 9 is a replaying out of the many passages in the Old Testament where Yahweh tramples the sea in the Old Testament, showing that he is now the Yahweh here who's come to uh, subdue the evil powers that encompass us. The feeding of the 5,000, and God will argue that, that in, understood in its apocalyptic context, which is how we always have to understand the New Testament, this is, a, this is itself a revolt against a corrupted nature. That, that plenty in, in God's creation, there would be no starvation. In fact, when Paul in, in Romans 8 talks about how nothing can separate us from, from the love of Christ, neither famine, nor pearl, nor sword, and he goes on, height or depth, principality and power, James Dunn and other scholars argue that all of those things are demonic powers understood in an apocalyptic context. And so famine is itself a demonic power. Um, and so Jesus, in multiplying the loaves and fishes, is really doing an exorcism on nature. He's, he's revolting against the, the demonic nature of, of famine. Then there, there's this. Uh, the cursing of the fig tree. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, in, in the apocalyptic worldview, um, it was understood that angels, everything in creation and everything in society is under the, under the guardianship of some angel, some angelic presence. Uh, in fact, that's an assumption that is widely shared throughout a lot of different cultures. And some of those angels have now gone AWOL and now use their say-so at cross-purposes with God. And, and in, apocalyptic, in the apocalyptic tradition, fig trees in particular uh, were um, symbolized uh, the fallen creation, the creation that now doesn't produce plenty. It produces famine. With the understanding that it produces famine because the angelic authorities who are in charge of the fruitfulness of the earth have gone AWOL. And so Jesus, in rebuking um, this, this uh, fig tree, is really putting on display that he's the Messiah who has come to reverse the curse. He curses the curse, in other words. This wasn't some kind of temper tantrum that he just threw because he was hungry and didn't have figs. Uh, no, he has come to say that when, when the mustard seed of what he's planted with his life, death, and resurrection is fully grown then there won't be any more barren fig trees, which in an apocalyptic worldview means there won't be any more barrenness at all. There won't be any more famine. There won't be any more starvation, uh, people dying of thirst. That's why you find throughout the New Testament that the effect of what Jesus did on the cross wasn't just about humans. In fact, I don't think it's even first and foremost about humans. Certainly God wants to liberate humans, but he's come to redeem the entire creation. These passages are all about a, uh, a, a creational restoration, all things being restored. And humans are restored because we've got to be restored to be the viceroys over this creation. And of course, in the first century worldview, they didn't distinguish between earth and all of creation. They didn't know about the creation we've got now, and we've got to do some work to try to integrate that. Uh, but uh, we were to be the landlords, the viceroys of, of this planet. And so we're restored, we're redeemed and reconciled to God, set free from Satan's power and restored to our rightful rulership. Uh, and then all creation will eventually be restored. And our job, kingdom people, is to manifest as much of that now as possible. It will be fully manifested when the kingdom comes in fullness, but our job 
as a way of opening up, manifesting the truth about who we are and uh, who God is and the kingdom that is now growing. We're to put as much of this on display as possible. So I submit to you that caring for animals and the earth is not some liberal agenda. It's a biblical agenda. It was our first mandate. For our first job description, I think it's still the best uh, benchmark as to how we're doing as a species. And frankly, we ain't doing so good. But it means the kingdom people, I don't, wherever you are, wherever you're stationed, whatever you do, you should at least, even if no one else does, take responsibility for what you put animals through to get to your plate. Yeah, our job is to care for the animals. Uh, and we do it not just for practical reasons, not because we think we're going to make a difference. We do it because it's who we are. It's what we're called to be. Uh, Jesus and reversing the effects of natural evil. And then note that in God's original and eschatological creation, it, 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 you get this vision that it was all to be nonviolent. However literal or figurative you take Genesis 1, doesn't matter. You can't escape the, the truth that in the beginning, in the I ideal of God, there was no violence in nature. And in the end, there'll be no violence in nature. Which tells me that violence in nature is not natural. Uh, so in Genesis 1, it says, I give you every, bearing, uh, uh, every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that was fruit with, it has fruit with seeds with it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds in the sky, and all the creatures that move on the ground... Everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. Which clearly indicates that God didn't give animals to each other for food. Um, that seems to be a result of the fall. Uh, when when uh, the viceroys of the earth fall, everything underneath them gets tainted. And um, uh, it suggests that violence in nature, red tooth and claw... This is the reason, the reason why Darwin actually lost his faith. At least one of the major reasons was he, he just couldn't reconcile the violence he saw in nature with a benevolent God. Uh, the, the violence he saw in nature looked like it was more designed by a roaring lion on, on prey. Who's the roaring lion in Scripture, seeking whom he may devour? It's Satan. Um, and um, we need to have some explanation for that. And then in the eschatological, in the end time kingdom, uh, the wolf will lay down with the lamb, the leopard will lay down with the goat, the calf and the lion, and on and on and on and on. You have this vision of a totally harmonious creation. Now, we can't begin to even speculate what a lion would look like that didn't eat a lamb. Uh, you know, because the only lions we've ever known have been the fallen ones. We, that's why we, we can know very little about uh, the, the, the coming kingdom. You know, Jesus' body, it's weird. It can pass through walls, but it can eat fish. You know, what's the deal here? Uh, um, uh, who, who knows how it's going to be? There's a continuity and discontinuity. We don't have to figure it out. Right now, I just want us to see that it, this assumes that all the violence, if I'm right about this, all the violence in nature is not part of the original design of God. It's the result of angelic beings who had authority over nature, going AWOL, now using their authority at cross purposes with God. And um, uh, it, it means that then part of our job is to reverse that as much as possible by any means possible, uh, to do what we can to bring creation back to uh, God's original design that he had for it. Uh, one other thing I'll say about this is um, I've read an article on this, and I, I, there's a few people in this room that need to get together and uh, put this into a project under the Roberta Winter Institute uh, auspices and, and get funding for this or whatever it takes. But to, to give a coherent, a coherent narrative uh, that would integrate the biblical teaching about creation and the fall and the corruption of nature with the best of science that's out there and integrate that with evolutionary theory uh, to give an account for why 99.9% uh, .9 of the scientists out there say that there was about a half billion years of violence on this planet before human beings ever got around here. Uh, is there a way of, of integrating that? And um, I've, I've published on the, putting out the, the idea of evolution as cosmic conflict. God creating, the crea the, the Satan discreating, uh, perverting, turning everything upside down. God then bringing good out of evil. Satan working to, to corrupt again. God then bringing good out of it. And it's a shimmy that goes forward um, as this, this warfare. 
and the human beings being created uh, as, as God's final act to take back this planet for God. Uh, Beth Snodderly has done some incredible work on Tohu Wabohu, uh, the formless and void of Genesis 1-2, and our role in pushing back the Tohu Wabohu. And there's some good stuff, groundbreaking, pioneering, exciting stuff to be done. We just got to get people uh, freed up to do it. And um, yeah, change this paradigm around. All right, let me uh, end with this. Well, I, I, I'm going to go, I'm going to skip this. Let's see here. Come on, go, go, go. Uh, the ongoing warfare, you, know, we, you all know this. Yeah, just read the book, get the book. Yeah, you, you know, just buy the book. Come on, come on, get already here. I'll, you know what? I'll just say a word about this already, not your attention. Um, in fact, I'll end with this. That even though Satan's in principle been defeated, he's still called the God of this age. He still has control of this entire world. He still prowls around like a roaring lion. The world is still under his authority. And it, it's a legitimate question to ask, well, what exactly did Jesus do? If you speak with any serious Jewish person, this will be, who still holds their orthodox faith, this will be their objection. Uh, wait a minute, you say that Jesus did all this stuff, which is the, what the Messiah is supposed to do. Uh, what? I don't see it. I don't see it. The world looks the same to me. So they're still waiting for the Messiah who's going to actually make a difference. And so it's important to be able to give some kind of an account of this. Uh, what we can see is that the coming of the kingdom... In the, in the standard apocalyptic worldview, they thought the realm of the, the age of darkness would go on, and then there'd be a radical inbreaking, and then the kingdom of God would be established on this earth. It'd be instantaneous, preceded by a cataclysmic battle. The New Testament nuances that uh, by inserting an interval between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. And in his first coming, he, in principle, does everything that needs to be done. But it's not manifested as fact. This is the already not yet tension, or sometimes called the realized eschatology of the New Testament. And um, uh, it's, it's about, the question is how to give a co coherent account of that. Um, I'll, I'll use two analogies that I, I find helpful. I'll, I'll give three analogies that some, some find helpful. Well, the main analogy that people use is the analogy of D-Day and V-Day. D-Day being Normandy Beach, uh, June 6, 1944, where... Uh, War historians tell us that, in principle, the U.S. and European allies uh, turned the tide of the war, and the war was decided on, uh, on D-Day. Uh, that battle broke the back of the German war machine, and it was then inevitable that, uh, that the U.S. allies would, would win the war. But there was still a year of fighting that had to be done until we got to V-Day, Victory Day. Um, so also, this analogy goes, Jesus fought D-Day for us, in principle tied up the strong man, in principle turned the tide, it's now certain that the war will uh, go in God's favor, but there are still important battles for us to fight, and, um, and, and, and he wants us to be empowered, since our goal from the start was to be rulers of this earth, he now emp empowers us to carry on his work. In fact, he himself is carrying on his work through us. The, the analogy that Jesus draws is he, has to tie, he ties up the strong man so that now we can plunder the house. And so we're to be plundering, taking it all back for God. A second analogy that, that I, I find helpful comes from uh, epigenetics. Uh, in genes, they used to think that, uh, in, in the, up until 15 years ago, um, they thought genes operated like clocks. You wound them up, and then they, when they hit a certain time, they went ding, they were like alarm clocks, and then you manifested that gene. So everything was decided from the inside out, regardless of where your environment it was. We now know that that's not quite accurate. Uh, we, we discovered uh, genetically identical twins who turn out very, very different, even though they got the same genes. Why? Well, we now understand that a good percentage of our genes aren't like alarm clocks at all. They are, they're there. Um, you have those genes, but something external has to happen to trigger them, to activate them. They're dormant genes until they're activated. So also, I think this is a good way to think about our identity in Christ. We are, I think, with the death and resurrection of Jesus, we've got a new creation. I think all things have been made new. I think we've been, uh, all has been forgiven, all has been reconciled. It's all been taken care of. But, and so God speaks that into being, and it is there. Just like in the beginning, he said, let there be light, and there was light. He speaks, and re reality occurs. The difference is that when God speaks the new creation into being, 
there's already a creation there. There's an old creation. There's deception there and bondage there. And so he's got to speak the new creation. The first creation didn't have to fight against anything. Genesis 1.1, he just spoke and it was there. The second creation, however, he's got to speak into stuff. And so it's got to push it back. It's there. It's just dormant. And now God's calling on his people to activate it. See the analogy here? It applies to our own life where I believe that I have got the, 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 the DNA of Abba Father because the Bible tells me that. I'm born from above. And so I believe that I am holy and pure and spotless and redeemed and, and can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and has the confidence of God. And he's not giving me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and solemn mind. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I have the mind of Christ. And on and on and on. It's all true. Now, do I look like that 100% of the time? Someone laughed. No, only 99% of the time. No, okay, it, that is who I truly am. The thing is, I am that, but I still have got the tapes from dad and mom and you know, stepmother and all the stuff that I've been told and all the things I've done and all the garbage in my brain. God now, he won't do it all for us because he never wanted to do it all himself unilaterally. If he wanted to do it himself all unilaterally, he wouldn't have created us. He wants partners. And so he empowers us to now, he says, I give it to you. You have got to activate it. It really, you don't create it. It's already there. You already are it. Never try to become holy. You are holy. What you got to do is activate the holiness you already got. So many Christians are trying to achieve what they've already got. That's the one sure way to never experience it. Because even if you get it, you don't get it for free, so you didn't really get it. you, you got to work that holiness. No, it's only, it's only godly holiness when, it, when you realize that it's your nature and he's given it to you by grace. But you activate it by faith. And faith is, is about envisioning. It's about your imagination. It's about seeing it. It's about being disciples of your brain. And to envision yourself as you truly are. That activates. It makes it come alive. Try it. Spend some time, disciplined time, seeing yourself as you truly are. And watch how it, it doesn't start to come alive in you. And then the next time a circumstance happens where you normally put on display your totally ungodly nature, you're equipped to step into a godly response. And the people go, whoa, that's different. Well, it's because you've been rehearsing it and you've been activating it. And now you can step into it. This is how we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're just putting, on, putting off the old and putting on the new. And then we do that with all creation. We, we, we activate it. We, we don't bring it into being. We just activate what's already in being. And the final analogy, and it's my favorite, though it's the least popular one, and it's the hardest to grasp. But here's the thing. If I turned off all the lights in this room and then turned all the lights in the room on again, you would say immediately, oh, Greg turned on the lights immediately. As soon as Greg turned on the lights, there was light. But if you were a muon particle, you would never say that. Not just because muon particles don't speak, but because muon particles travel close to the speed of light, and therefore time is very different from them. You've read your Einstein. Uh, that's why they only live a fraction of a second. Um, and if, so if you were a muon particle, it would take, for a room this size, it would probably take two generations to fill up the, if you're a muon particle, you'd see me turn on the light, and then you'd see the photons begin to push out the darkness. And you're like, what's taking so long? We're going to die pretty soon. And your son comes along and says, Dad, I thought you said it was going to be right away. Well, that's what we were told. Why does he delay the light filling the room? I don't know. I'm just a muon. Uh, <laughs> but see, from a human perspective, it happens instantaneously. From a muon's perspective, it takes generations. So also, I think from God's perspective... I don't think God's timeless. I think there's a sequence of before and after. Every verb applied to God in the Bible implies there's a before or after. But he certainly measures time very different than, than we do because he's been around for eternity and we're not. For the same reason that I will experience this year twice as fast as my daughter because I'm twice as old, so it's a, it, it, it's a much smaller fragment of the whole pie. If God's been around forever, then any duration of time he experiences is infinitesimally small. So from God's perspective, boom, Jesus dies, rises from the dead, new creation, all done. From our perspective, we're little muons. We're like, what is taking him so long? He said it was done. Well, it is done in principle. Uh, but uh, from your perspective, it's just taken longer than, than we thought. All right, we're going to have a panel discussion. Come on down, panelists.